Kathy is an avid birder, and for over 10 years, she's led hundreds of walks for individual, conservation organization, private groups, and lifelong learning programs. And she's taught dozens of hands-on birding-related classes. Some of you actually may have gone on a bird walk with her um, as she does up for the Conservancy as well. She loves sharing her passion with others. She's an active member of the Phoenix Area Audubon Society. And her motto is, if it's not fun, it's not worth it. So that's somebody I want to hang out with. So thanks so much, Kathy, for being here and sharing your time and expertise. And we're going to let you take it away. All righty. I'll go ahead and get my screen shared here and we'll get started. Okay. So today we're going to cover... Um, a dozen of uh, some of the most common birds of the McDowell Sonoran Preserve. And right up front there, there's my email. Um, I often get emails from people asking me what bird is this? And they send me sometimes a great photo, sometimes um, a terrible photo, and sometimes it's not even a bird. So, uh, but I, I learn by, by answering those questions. And um, so if you wanna take my email down, go ahead and, and do that. The structure of this is uh, we're going to do these birds one at a time. Uh, bird by Bird is the, is the name of a book of someone who needed to write a book, and um, they did it bird by bird. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, take, take that to heart and go ahead and get started. I'll stop after each bird for any questions you might have. So let me see here if I can get this to advance here. There we go. We're going to, these, these birds are um, uh, organized by size. We're going to start with the little bitty ones, and then we're going to go to the bigger ones. Um, we won't do any of the great big ones today, but if you like this presentation, it's, it's certainly that I, one that I can um, expand to include other birds that you see in the preserve. All right, so each, each bird in, is indicated by um, uh, the size at the top there, uh, and for the size for me is covered up by the, oh, <laughs> you know, I clicked, but I didn't know what I was clicking on. Let me turn those both off for a second here. Um, I was looking for the size of this guy and it's only, it's only four, four, and, four inches, um, four and a half inches, excuse me. Uh, so this is a little bitty bird right now. It's very common right now because it's got lots of babies. These guys have already nested and the babies are out and about. Babies won't have the little yellow head. They, they'll be all gray, but you're gonna be able to tell that they're babies because instead of that gray bill, it's got a little yellow bill. When you think about um, these little bitty birds, they're very active and they're quite noisy and we'll listen to the, um, to the sounds in just a minute. Um, they, they, um, they, they bring to mind chickadees and, and they, for a long time they were thought to re, be related to chickadees, but they're not. They're, they're actually in their an entirely different family, um, all of which is in um, the old world. This is the only one in the new world. At least that's where we are right now. Things are changing in, in the scientific world with DNA and we'll probably learn some more. But for now, look for a little active gray bird that you can't get your binoculars on, um, jumping around and building multiple nests. And on the bottom of this slide, there are two pictures of its nest. And its nest is not a cup like most birds. It is a about football sized and um, it is a complete shelter with a hole on the side or on the bottom. What's remarkable about these nests is not only do they build them year round, but um, they place them and the hole of the nest so as to take advantage of whatever weather they want to take advantage of. Um, if the nest is built in the winter and they want a sunny location, then the nest will be on the outside of the branches uh, of a tree. Mesquite is you know, a very common tree it's in, or uh, up near the top where there's going to be more sun. If they build a nest in the summer, they will orient the hole towards the prevailing wind so that any cooling breezes, um, they can take advantage of that. Uh, we should do so well in sighting our own homes. 
um, as this guy does. Uh, oftentimes we put our homes where they really shouldn't be. <laughs> but in any case, let's talk a little bit about the nest itself. Um, and each of these slides has a question or a statement. And if you uh, print it out or want to follow along, not all the uh, statements following the, the, the top one is, um, is accurate. And I will tell you which ones are and which ones aren't. So it does not necessarily decorate its um, nest with yellow flowers. So A is not accurate, but B is used, uh, is accurate. It is used around, year round uh, for roosting, sometimes with a family, sometimes without a family. Um, and C, now you already know that the placement of its opening is to catch prevailing winds for cooling. Um, but that's not the only uh, consideration, but it is one of the main considerations since we live in the desert. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, calls versus songs in birds. Um, the whole world of birds is, is divided in between songbirds and everything else. Songbirds are things like this little guy that we're looking at here and robins and thrashers and uh, warblers and uh, phanopeplas. Those are all songbirds. What aren't songbirds are things like ducks and owls and hawks. Um, and, and even hummingbirds are not songbirds. But in the songbird part of the bird world, they are um, equipped with an anatomy that allows them to uh, vocalize in many, many different ways. Uh, there are whole books written on how birds vocalize and they use a lot of different sounds for a lot of different meanings. Um, some of them are so sophisticated. Uh, we just mentioned chickadees. Chickadees will tell other chickadees by their vocalizations um, about the presence of a predator, but they will distinguish a predator like a Cooper's hawk um, uh, coming at them from far away and arriving immediately as opposed to one that's just sitting around. So it's very, very sophisticated. But all we're gonna talk about today are the difference between calls and songs. Um, and most of the year, what you'll hear from a verdant is a tick, tick, tick noise, tick, 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 tick. Um, and that that is just one of the vocalizations to keep in communication with other verdants and other birds generally. Um, it seems that a lot of songbirds actually uh, understand the language of other songbirds, especially the alarm calls. Um, during the spring, most songbirds will turn to singing. And uh, singing is a different way of communicating. And it usually has just two um, reasons for being. And that one is to attract a mate. And the second is to uh, establish and maintain territory. So you'll hear singing now, although a lot of the singing has already taken place because these guys have nested and have raised their first round of uh, babies. But let's listen to the tick, tick, tick. You, you, um, you'll find it very familiar, I think. I'm sure you've got that one down. It's just tick, tick, tick. Um, it can be fast, it can be slow. Um, it has probably several meanings that we don't yet understand, but um, that's, that's its main communication and the one that you'll hear most of the year. Um, for the other song, I'm having trouble with my, there we go. Uh, it will, whoops, excuse me. It will repeat that that two, two, two song, and that's more musical than the tick, tick, tick. Let's hear it again. And that's what you're hearing now um, in the spring. And it will be quite repetitive, but it's usually just uh, the three phrases together. So that's all I have to say about the verdant. Does anybody have any questions? And then we'll move on to the next bird. Actually, I do have a question, Kathy. You mentioned that uh, hummingbirds are not songbirds. Do hummingbirds? Do they make any sound? I haven't. Oh. 
Absolutely. And actually, our Anna's hummingbird is one of the most vocal. It's probably the most vocal of the hummingbirds here in the United States. But hummingbirds make all sorts of buzzes and clicks. And of course, um, they they make sounds with their feathers, too. It's not a vocalization. But if those of you who might have um, homes up in um, Payson or Prescott or Flag for the summer, you'll hear the broad uh, broad-tailed hummingbird up there. It makes a sound with its with its wing feathers. Anna's actually makes a sound with Anna's hummingbird, the one of the desert here. It makes a sound with its tail feathers when it's doing its display. So yeah, they do have um, they they vocalize the squeaky little non-musical things because they they don't have the anatomy that a songbird has. But um, yes, they do have other um, vocalizations. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go on to another little bitty guy. Um, and this is the lesser goldfinch. And these guys are pretty vocal too. Uh, it, but let's talk a little bit about, about um, what they look like. You'll see that this has got a um, kind of a conical bill. It's not long and skinny. It's kind of short and stumpy. But um, the bill on this bird will tell you immediately it's a seed eater. Um, you know, the finches and sparrows are mainly seed eaters. Um, those, those powerful little bills, even though they're small, that will help them crunch through seeds. And if you have um, these guys come into your feeder and you watch carefully, same with the house finches, which we'll talk about as well. You'll watch them with crunch a seed and then manipulate the meat um, with its tongue um, into its mouth. And then of course the, the, the seed shells fall into your, into your property. But they do this out outdoors, I mean, out, out in the wild as well. They'll also eat other things. Um, they will eat insects, particularly during the, the, the breeding season. These guys um, the, are very busy at the nest, so they need their energy. They also need to feed their babies some, some um, uh, protein to make them grow. Uh, not, not nearly as much as other birds, but um, in fact, finches are our best vegetarians. They eat pretty much all, all seeds. So what is it about the male um, uh, um, goldfinch, which is at the top here, the lesser goldfinch? He's got this bright yellow chest. The females can be um, much gray or yellow looking, or even can be kind of yellow whitish looking. Um, he's more striking. He needs to be like pretty much all, uh, all birds, not all of them, but all, almost all of them. He, it's his job to attract her and the prettier he is, um, the more uh, impressed she is. So he's going to be more colorful. She, on the other hand, is often the, the bird that spends more time at the nest and feeding the young and to avoid giving away the, the nest um, by being gaudily colored, she's much more subtly colored. Um, anyway, uh, to attract her as well as being beautiful, he needs to sing and uh, he will attract the female by fluttering and flying and making a singing display with his wings and tail spread wide. And when he does that, you can actually see the white wing patches in his wings. Um, you can see kind of the blotchiness of the wings of the female on the bottom there, um, but uh, it, it will be more apparent um, that um, in, in the male and that fluttering flight. Does he help feed the young? Let me, let me check my notes. I believe he does. Um, he also helps feed her while she in incubates. And can have a black, green, or yellow back? Um, no, he can't have a yellow back, but this guy comes in slightly different colors. His back can be greenish and it can be black. The black form of this guy is a lot less uh, common than the greenish back. Um, you can see the kind of the green color, the yellow green color that she has. That's usually what's on his back, but he can be black too and maybe, um, that's a more common form in Texas, but we do get them here. So if you see one of these guys and you think, oh, I know a lesser goldfinch, and then you see one with a completely black back, you think, hmm, maybe I don't know a lesser goldfinch that well, but it is the same bird. It's just a different, different form. All right, we're going to listen to its voice. It's 
well um, well um, described. I wheezes, trills, and stutters, and I probably got that off a website or out of one of my um, burning books. There's just a lot going on in this song. Let's listen to it again. time I uh <laughs> every time I uh, use my uh mouse something else happens <laughs> anyway all right so uh one thing I want to let you know if you thought you heard other bird songs in this little lesser goldfinch um series of wheezes trills and stutters you may well have because this bird is also a mimic um, it's not as well studied as say the mockingbird is a mimic, but it is also a mimic. So you, you might think, oh, I know, I hear a, a bird and then you look up and it's actually a lesser goldfinch. You're not wrong. It's just um, playing a few games with you. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a cool little bird. They usually are in twos and threes. Um, uh, there might be a small flock of six or seven of them. Uh, they're year round. And um, they're, they're just bright little uh, birds to see in the desert. It's our, our, our main yellowish bird that you, that you will see that's, that's a little bitty like this. Any questions about this guy before we get go on? I think Tony had a question. You want to ask your question, Tony? Well, she had put it into the chat, and so I will ask it for her. She wants to know, is there a difference um, with... You, you know, the birds you're highlighting, are some of them more in the Northern Preserve and some of them more in the Southern Preserve? Um, they'll, they'll probably be all over in the preserve. These are desert birds. Um, and some of these are, are very common elsewhere as well in other deserts and, and you know, way beyond the preserve. Um, you, this particular bird, the lesser goldfinch is, um, I find him up in Payson and uh, you know, he just has a huge range and is very adaptable. The verdant is a desert bird, but it its its range is from Texas to California. So these these are widespread birds, or so far. <laughs> Great, thank you. Anybody Any other else? questions? Okay, we'll we'll head on to our next bird. Um, this is our blackbird sparrow. And this is probably the most common sparrow in the in the preserve. Um, in the and I think the most salient thing about this little guy is you know, that big white eyebrow, and then under his eye, he seems to have a white mustache as well. Uh, the black throat is is uh, pretty obvious on mature males, not so much on females. It can kind of look kind of bland. Um, and but the picture on in the middle at the bottom there, not in the middle to the left on the bottom, is uh, a juvenile. And you go, how do you know that one? Well, just look at that big eyebrow, and then you can see the white mustache starting to form, and or it's there. It just doesn't have the contrast with the black chin so much. But that big white eyebrow um, and a little chunky bill, because this is a sparrow, it's a seed eater. Um, we'll give this away, this bird away. You're probably not going to see other birds in the preserve um, nearly as frequently as this one with a big white eyebrow like this one has. So um, this guy is a year round bird in the preserve. Um, I don't know how far his range is for, you know, outside of, of the desert um, areas, but it is, it is a classic desert bird. So is it, what about its diet? Is it, is it enhanced by bird feeders? I've never seen this bird at, a, at the bird feeder, never. Um, it may come to bird feeders uh, if it, the bird feeder is perhaps next to the preserve, but it's never come to mine. And I'm in the suburbs of, of Scottsdale um, and I, I virtually never see it in my, in my neighborhood. It's always out in the desert. Um, all, all the, um, uh, seeds it eats supply the moisture it needs. It virtually never drinks water. It will drink water when, when the water is available, but it doesn't have to. Um, it, it, is, it is a 
classic adapted desert bird that, that does very well in, in, in our extreme um, environment here. And it is it does eat mostly seeds in the winter and, um, and insects in the summer. So it's one of the ones that we can thank when things are buzzing around our heads, these guys are helping to keep them under control. So in this bird, I'm going to give you um, the, the song, I believe, rather than the call. Let's see, listen and, and see whether high pitched and tinkling. Um, I think that's a good description too. Again, my, my experience with this bird indicates that this would not, <laughs> I can turn off the song, but I can't keep on, <laughs> sorry, um, can't keep on the same slide. The, is that this bird will only be singing the song in the spring this, to establish and maintain territory and to uh, attract a mate. During the rest of the year, you'll hear high pitched little tinky song sounds, but they'll be more like the Verdon in terms of it, it's um, kind of repetitive and flat. Um, and not 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 tinkling like this or musical like like this one. Um, pretty bird. Uh, and and for those of us who are crazy about birds, this is a whisperer we all like because we can identify it. It's not um, as hard as some of the other sparrows. So do we have any questions for this bird? If not, we'll go on to the next one. Okay, so this is our house finch. Notice again, we're, we've got the, this chunky little strong bill. He tells us it's a seed eater. This guy is uh, 5.7 inches average. And the males and females look quite different. Um, there's a nice picture of them up on the left there. The male is um, mostly that kind of cherry red um, on his head and chest. He also has a patch um, between his wings uh, and above his tail, a rump patch of the same color cherry red, if, although maybe a little bit muted. The female, she's all over brown, um, kind of streaky, stripy. Um, and uh, she, she never has, shows any red. Now his red coloring, uh, the, as I say, the common color is, is that cherry red, but um, his coloring has a lot to do with what he eats. And um, he, so he can actually, his coloring actually can be uh, yellow, it can be orange, it can be gold, it can be kind of a combination of, of those colors. But it all always just shows on the head and chest, a little bit on the back of the head and, and that, that rump patch. Um, but uh, the, that aberration in color is a, is a Western phenomenon. When I moved out here from the East, uh, I had never seen a golden house finch. It really took me aback at first, um, but now I'm a little bit used to it. The gold color is very unusual. Um, you'll, you'll see hundreds of house finches be ever, before you ever see a gold one, and then you'll wonder why you've overlooked them. Okay, so what were these also known as? Pinky finches, LBJs, Hollywood finches. LBJs is a birder term for little brown jobs. So they're the ones that we can't really identify very well. So yeah, this is a little brown job. It looks like a lot of other sparrowy like birds. Um, and um, some buntings and yeah, it's it, so yes, they, they are also known as LBJs, but their, their other nickname is Hollywood finches. These birds are birds of the West. And when we listen to their song, it's a happy little cheery song, you'll figure out why they were captured as cage birds and sold in the East. It's because of their song. It's just, just lovely. And um, so they were sold in the East and uh, come the uh, Migratory Bird Act, the Congressional Act to, to protect migratory birds, uh, when these cage birds were no longer um, uh, allowed to be held in, in captivity, uh, pet stores in New York City released all their, their, um, their caged house finches. And these little guys established themselves in New York. 
Um, and then pretty much all up and down the East Coast and then further west in Pennsylvania and um, Missouri. So if you have a series of bird books at home, you would see the range maps of these two, these birds um, meeting in the middle of the country. The Western population has always been there, but the Eastern population has spread out from New York City to encompass most of the east uh, of the Mississippi River. And I suspect that uh, the range map will cover the whole of the United States at some point. They're, they're, they're getting very close um, in, in terms of their spread. Okay, so let's listen to this guy here. There we go again. So um, I think loose musical chatter is is a good description of this one. Um, you can you could hear that chatter in the background. Starts out with a couple little what I consider kind of whiny voice goes right, 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 and then it might um, it might just stick with that kind of call, or it might break into song and and um, get itself uh, caged. For, for the uh, cage bird, bird uh, um, population. Not anymore though. Okay, before we go on, um, these guys are often in little flocks, often virtually always in pairs, but often in little flocks. Uh, they sing while they fly, just like the goldfinches do. So you can hear them go over um, and identify them even, even in flight. Any questions for these guys? Alrighty, we'll go on to the Phanapepla, black cardinal or fake cardinal. This is this is, uh, Phanapepla is is kind of a mouthful of a word. It's it's kind of a um, not as big as you might think. It's not even eight inches, you know, seven point seven inches. Um, it has a has a personality, and I I think a presence is way bigger than its size. It's also a very slender bird, and there are males and females, of course. Male being the bird on the left there. And then um, the female being the, um, the gray version of him. Uh, she also has white wing patches in flight. It's, they're hard to see when they're not in flight. Uh, the, the wing patch shows in the photo at the bottom there. Um, but because hers are um, not as contrasted with her gray plumage, they don't show up as easily. So, uh, these guys have a very special relationship with, with mistletoe. They not only build their nests inside mistletoe, but they also um, eat the mistletoe berries and spread mistletoe as a result of eating the berries. <clears throat> I've been told that um, once these guys, the mistletoe berry has, has fruit around the outside and then a seed on the inside. And I understand the seeds are very tacky. They're very sticky. Um, and so when the, the, the um, phanopepla excretes the mistletoe and it lands on a branch of a tree, it will stick there. Um, and then, you know, it's a kind of parasitic type of plant and, then, uh, and it will grow roots into the plant. But apparently it's a race depending on whether it rains or not, because if it is, if it's rainy, that stickiness will wash off and the, and the seed will wash off the branch that it's landed on. If it doesn't rain, then it can stick and then grow into another clump of mistletoe. Um, it kind of makes these birds farmers of mistletoe and that they, they grow it, um, but that's not unique to, um, to Phanopeplus, um, it's maybe their, their plant that they, they farm, but a lot of birds spread a lot of seeds. Um, I'm just beginning to learn about how dependent we are on birds as uh, seed dispersers, um, particularly for some of our forests in the North. Uh, they are very important. Uh, we, we could not do what they do free for us to, to, um, to regenerate for us. They're, they're pretty amazing. Not this little guy, this guy's mostly mistletoe. Okay, so they're um, 
members of a very small flycatcher family. Um, the flycatcher family is in general, and I don't think we talk about fly, any other flycatchers because this is uh, flycatchers are generally summer birds. And uh, if we wanted to do a program on summer birds only, we'd be talking a lot about flycatchers. And the flycatcher family um, is the largest bird family of birds in the world. There are a lot of different kinds of ducks. There are a lot of different kinds of hawks. There are a lot of different kinds of hummingbirds. But there are between 350 and 400 and some fly catchers in the world. Thank goodness we'd be we'd be up to our elbows in bugs if without the fly catchers. But this particular bird is member of a very small uh, member uh, of flycatcher family called silky flycatchers, and there's only five of them, or four or five of them. They're really small and and unique. They and they all are kind of shaped like this, with a little tuft. Um, and actually, phanopepla means silky cloak. Uh, so it takes its name in part from the family that it's a member of. So anyway, what's, what are some of the unique features of this particular bird? A, they're floppy, almost can't stay up here any longer flight. I mean, that's how I perceive their flight. If uh, you, you're not going to see these birds now and look for them all winter, but they're not around now. A lot of them have moved to higher altitudes. They're invisible white wing patches. I think that's pretty remarkable about this bird that it can fold those white wing patches. We, we looked at other birds with white wing patches and when the bird, the wings were folded, we could see them. Not this guy. Look at, look at how, you know, uniformly black he looks. Um, and C, their unusual breeding behavior. Yeah, they breed in two entirely different habitats. They bred once in the desert. The, they have already done their thing here now, even though it's only mid-May, and they are gone um, largely. Some of them will stay behind, but they are gone and uh, will go up to sort of mid-level ele elevations, uh, juniper woodlands and things like that, and will breed again. Um, I don't know of any other bird that breeds in entirely two different habitats. Um, a lot of birds breed twice, but they breed in the same area. Um, these guys undertake a fairly short migratory journey, but still, I think it's pretty remarkable um, to think about that. All right, so these guys have a lot of different vocalizations. Um, the, I'm gonna play the one that you hear the most and um, see if you think it says, what? 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 And back to that. So, um, <laughs> so somebody explaining this on a bird walk to me, and I thought it was great. Um, somebody says, oh, that's a faint of pepla. And it goes, what? That's a faint of pepla. What? That's a faint of pepla. What? Uh, so it's a good mnemonic, I think, for uh, remembering what these guys say. It's a very soft little call. It does have some funny um, other vocalizations that you'll hear in the springtime, early spring, when it's when it's uh, doing um, territorial defense and, and attracting a female. Not musical. These guys aren't very musical. Flycatchers, as a general rule, are not. But um, this guy is a, is a true uh, songbird. A lot of flycatchers are... Um, are, are not entirely into the into the songbird mode. They are, they're in the songbird part of the book, but their anatomy doesn't allow them to sing like songbirds. They, anatomy um, produces kind of flat, repetitive sounds. Um, this guy can sing and vocalize, but it's not very musical. Any questions about this odd, odd bird? This is an odd bird. We're really lucky to have this really unusual bird in our Sonoran Desert. Okay, one nickname for this um, bird is uh, Mesquite King, a little crown there. And also uh, another one is Devil Bird. Oh. All right, here is our state bird, the Cactus Wren. And he is what, eight inches do I have on here? Eight and a half inches. This is the biggest wren um, there is, certainly in the United States. My mother was an avid birder um, and uh, she was very familiar with house wrens, uh, which are a very common bird all over the United States. House wrens are maybe five inches. 
and she'd come to Arizona and her memory wasn't very good at the end. And she'd ask me, what's that bird? And I said, that's a cactus wren. And she goes, no, it's not a wren. It's too big. Um, so anyway, that's, um, this is a large wren. <laughs> Um, and it, it also has a white eyebrow, but you can see the difference between this guy and that um, sparrow. I'm going to go back to the sparrow real quick. You'll see how kind of plain, um, see how plain he is, not stripey, not patterned, except for that white eyebrow and then uh, uh, the, the um, white mustache and the black bib. Um, whoops. Oh, that's interesting. Get out of that. Now we'll go down. Whoop. My computer cannot tell the difference between <laughs> the slides and the, or I can't, one or the other. <laughs> Let's go with one more here. All right, there's our cactus ran. Um, and uh, it's, it's nest you've probably seen all over the preserve. It is always made out of grasses and fine twigs. It's not a lot of sticks um, and it's sideways and generally in a choya, although it will build nests elsewhere. Um, and uh, it's pretty classic. It's oftentimes not that far off the trail. It's, it, you can kind of almost look into it. Uh, unique to the cactus wren um, is that they do build multiple nests. But um, they steal nesting material from other birds to do that. And they puncture other birds' eggs. So this is our state bird. And I've often wondered whether our legislators knew that they st stole nesting material and punctured other birds' eggs when they chose it as our state bird. Now, in, in all due respect, um, they probably didn't know that at the time. I want to think that uh, these birds were chosen for this because a women's group was having an annual convention and they, we didn't have a state bird. And this is back in the early 1900s. We didn't have a state bird at that point. It was probably 1920, 1930. Um, we were hardly a state and they, um, they, uh, one of the cactus wren and, and we that's what we got. It's a stunning bird. I mean, look at all that patterning and the colors and oh, it's just a really beautiful bird. It's also one fun to watch. It's it's usually pretty confiding and they'll come right up to your back door if uh, they find insects there and they'll poke around. I found one in my car once. Um, I left the windows cracked because of the heat and um, came back uh, and there was a cactus wren, frantic, flying around in my car. So they, they can, you can see them up close up. Um, I wouldn't recommend um, having one in your car. They made a big mess, but anyway, still fun to, to watch. Got kind of a dark bib type area, but more speckly than the, than the black-throated sparrow that we looked at. And uh, this is probably the call that, that pretty much everybody's familiar with. Let's see if I can get on here. So, A little variation on a theme, um, and they do have some other calls, but um, that gives you a, a good feel for, for that particular bird. Uh, people analogize that to a car that won't start, um, especially those, those of you snowbirds who are, are out of the area now. You probably remember that from, from winters <laughs> up in the, in, the, in the north. I, too. You turn your key and it will just rah, 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 rah. <laughs> nothing's happening in the winter. Um, you have to really poke it along a little bit. So this is this is a fun bird. Um, any questions about this one? Well, actually, Robin posted that he had a similar experience that you did in your car, only it was in his house. Oh, so gosh. It taught, him, it taught him to keep the uh, the back door closed because the cactus run was kind of strolling around like he owned the place. <laughs> Tony wanted to know if they build multiple nests in the same season. And if they do, do they have multiple broods at the same time? Um, 
they might have somewhat overlapping broods, but not exactly at the same time. The, the scheme that I've heard about the wren family in general, and I, I assume this is correct about the cactus wrens, uh, is that they are pretty much springtime nesters, unlike the verdans who are building nests all the time. These guys are mostly springtime nesters, and the male cactus wren will choose, oh, I don't know, three, four, five, six different sites in which to build a nest. And he does most of the work. And then he brings the female around to show her the nests in the different, I'll say neighborhoods um, that uh, he's, he's built the nests in. You know, he might suggest that this one's near water or this one's got a great uh, uh, stash of insects nearby because of the plants that are in, in the area, or this one has a great view or the schools are good in this neighborhood or whatever, you know, what, what do cactus friends think about? I, I don't know. So, and then she chooses the nest um, mm -hmm. that she thinks is, is uh, the, 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 the best made one or the one in the, in the neighborhood that she, she likes the best. And, um, um, and, and then they will they will bring up a brood. Now, depending on when that brood starts to fledge and, and whether one parent can feed that brood successfully, the male may then go and attract, try and attract another mate to have uh, another family with a different mate. So uh, a little bit of both, Tony, going on. Any other questions? Okay, let's go on. See how many we can get in here. All right, loggerhead shrike. This is a bird that you don't see too frequently in the preserve, um, but it's a it's a stunning bird. It's it, and it generally sits up nice and high, like both these photographs indicate. The males and females look virtually identical. In fact, I couldn't tell you what the difference um, is between the two. Uh, it's it, it's here mostly in the um, winter. Uh, my experience is that the most of them leave in the summer, although I, I found out that they nest in the preserve because I, I help with the counts on the, um, uh, in the preserve. And, and we found a nest of these guys uh, up in Brown's Ranch, which was just so much fun. And we saw them feeding babies. And, and yeah, that was pretty striking. So these little guys, are, they're not too big. They're nine inches. They're kind of a husky looking bird they look kind of well fed and um they have this black mask and a very very white belly this is these pictures are not um photoshopped in any way to show how white these bellies look and in fact against a, a hillside if they're facing you you'll think that that you're you're looking at a piece of trash maybe or something is just very striking white belly it's gray on the back you know, black and white wings um and uh, it it sits high it's an insect eater but it also in, uh will eat lizards uh, birds birds eggs um other uh little critters as well it's also known as a butcher bird and i have to tell you uh a is not correct um, B is correct. It has a grisly habit of impaling its prey on barbed wire fences. And um, so if you ever, and, and it's not necessarily barbed wire fences, obviously, we, this bird has evolved way before barbed wire fences were a thing. Um, but if you ever come across a, a grasshopper or a baby mouse or something impaled on um, a mesquite thorn or um, any other kind of thorny thing, um, it's probably this guy who's doing that. So um, <laughs> his cousin, the, the Northern Shrike, they've studied the cousin um, better than this guy, or at least I haven't, I don't know that this is true. But in the Northern Shrike, um, they've studied the, this habit of putting things on uh, uh, on fences. And they, they, Tosantis call it the larder. Um, it may be a whole collection of, of bugs and lizard pieces and that sort of thing, um, all in the same place. And apparently that is very attractive to a female, uh, that, a that a large, um, larder full of good yummy stuff to come and snack on is, it shows that he's a, he's a good provider and that sh she's attracted to that. And the, the downside of that is that 
apparently now with our litter, um, these the loggerhead strike now also puts leaves and, and gum wrappers and cigarette butts in the larder to make it look more impressive. Um, I guess with the hope of attracting um, a female just because of the size of the larder as opposed to its quality. So in any case, uh, I, I'd love to see some scientific evidence of that happening with this guy because I think it's a pretty interesting phenomenon. Does it look like it's wearing a white apron? It does to me. I mean, it's a very dazzling white. It's one of the whitest birds outside of our you know, shorebirds like uh, seagulls and terns and things like that, um, which we don't see too much in the desert. Any questions about this guy? Okay, this guy does not vocalize much. And so I'm not gonna, I don't have a, um, a, uh, a sound for to get confused with. All right, American kestrel. All right, this is this guy's also about the same size as a logged shrike. Looks entirely different. That's a male on the left. It's a female on the right. Uh, most hawks look exactly alike. Um, the only difference between male and female is basically size. These guys look quite different. Um, and these are falcons. Falcons you might know are no longer considered members of the hawk family. They are considered uh, more closely related to parrots than to like the red tail hawk or the Cooper's hawk or um, eagles or anything like that. So um, if you're confused with your new bird guide and you can't find this guy, look, look under the, um, look under the, uh, near the parrots <laughs> and you'll find all the falcons there. The bird guides are often um, organized by taxonomic order. And these guys are, have been re, um, rearranged to, because they're smart. They're very smart like parrots. Well, we, we're learning a lot more about the falcons as, as to their intelligence. All right, so it's a falcon. Are they prey to uh, larger hawks? Not generally. These guys are, uh, are speedy. They're um, very manipulative. Um, they, um, they can manipulate in the air. They actually, um, uh, um, uh, attack other hawks. You, if you see a red-tailed hawk being harassed by a very uh, agile, smaller bird, it could be one of these guys, an American kestrel. Um, can they hover? Yes and no. The only birds that actually hover, like a helicopter hovers, are hummingbirds. And that's because of the structure of their, um, their, their wings and bones and muscles. These guys can fly into the wind and look like they're hovering. And when they do that, what they're looking for is prey on the ground. Um, and this, this is the first bird I came to find out um, actually can see ultraviolet light. But I've now found out that all birds can see ultraviolet light. And when they are hovering, they are looking for the ultraviolet light that is reflected off of the urine of small critters that would be their prey, um, such as mice or voles in the fields. So um, they are looking for those lines of, of urine um, and, the, and the ultraviolet light as they hover, and then they will um, swoop down and get them. They are also known as sparrowhawks. They do take um, birds out of the air. Um, the way a kestrel or the, and the falcons generally hunt is not like necessarily for, for a, a winged creature, is not necessarily like a, um, a other hawks. These guys will ball up their talons and actually um, fly at a, say a sparrow, um, at high speed and just knock the bejesus out of a, of a bird. Um, it, it probably won't kill it on impact, um, but uh, I've only seen this happen once, and, um, but the bird will kind of explode into feathers. It might not be dead, but there's a lot of feather debris. And as the bird falls, the, the uh, falcon can actually grab it out of the air or it'll go down the ground on top of the bird. It has um, a, um, a little pointy part of its bill right in the middle of the bill. I'm gonna, uh, if you can see my cursor, you, uh, between the upper and lower um, mandibles of uh, bill, there's just a little tooth that 
that kind of hangs down. It's part of the, the um, bill itself. It's called the tomial tooth. And that tooth uh, fits between the vertebrae of um, small rodents perfectly. So it can snap the vertebrae of a, a struggling mouse, for example, uh, instantly. And that's how it dispatches uh, some, of, some of its prey. Let's listen to it. See if it goes again. Yeah, it, so I don't hear this too often, but when you hear it, it's pretty distinctive, I think. We're hearing some other birds in the background now. Key, 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 key. All right, any questions about this falcon? Also, perches high, often pretty far off the trail, but pretty distinctive. Um, uh, likes to sit on cactuses. Any questions? Okay, let's see. Um, Kila woodpecker. I think virtually everybody knows this, this bird. Um, it's a male and a female in the picture. The male has a little red cap. She does not. Um, these are the principal so architects of the holes in the saguaro. Um, they can reuse the same spot year after year. Uh, but they're, <laughs> because they're so good at, at making holes in the saguaros and other birds aren't, uh, other birds generally move in after the Gila woodpecker has created and used the nest. So you see starlings in the nest, you see um, owls in the nest, um, you see uh, flycatchers in the nest, kestrels like to nest in these holes. So um, they, the woodpeckers generally have to start all over again. And I've heard um, after the the um, hole is made in the saguaro and, and you all are familiar with the the boots that they create when when the saguaro makes that that crusty scab um that that scab takes months to to dry out so even though they've made a hole they can't use it right away because it's still kind of gummy and they have to wait for it to dry out um but they are busy and they make a lot of holes but they because of all those holes are our uh, desert is just full of other birds that, that uh, take over those spots. And we're, we're very lucky for that. All right, Jill, they make a lot of different vocalizations too. This is my husband's um, favorite, which he describes as a squeeze toy. Right? Any, any, um, any questions on our saguaro, I mean, on our Gila woodpecker, or, or saguaro king, if you will. I don't hear any questions, but Cassie, I am loving this, but unfortunately we're almost out of time. So maybe just one more. I think that's probably all I got. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's great. Let's go. Okay, we'll go with the towie. All right. So this is, this is kind of a skulky bird. Um, you might think, oh, I, I know now that that's a seed eating bird. That's, could it possibly be the member of a sparrow family? And you're absolutely right. Tohees are members of the sparrow family. They're just bigger. Um, and uh, so this guy uh, is, is, uh, is kind of skulky, hangs around on the ground because it, it's a seed eater, eats things off the ground. Um, it is, I will say, uh, unique to the Sonoran Desert only. It, it, its range does go into uh, Utah and Nevada a little bit, um, California, certainly Sonora, Mexico. Um, uh, but it, it, for, for birders who like to collect birds um, on their list, this is a go-to bird for coming here. Uh, you can't find this bird anywhere else in the world. That's unlike a lot of the things that we have um, talked about that are elsewhere in the United States or in Mexico. But this guy's is got a very, very small range. Um, we hear two sounds from this guy. And uh, we'll go with the one that you hear most of the time. It's uh, kind of a peepy -pee sound. And then towards the spring, he makes this sound. I, 
actually that's his year round sound. I don't know how you would how you would describe that. It is one that you hear. It is a communication sound when two birds, two toeys get together. Um, Somebody described that as, as witches around a cauldron. I, I think it's almost like, so where were you last night? It sounds kind of ticked off to me. <laughs> but um, in any case, that will stop with the Abert's Toey. Uh, and look out for this one. Just a little black mask and otherwise pretty much all over the same kind of desert colored little rufous under the, under the tail. Um, kind of hard to, to see. Stays pretty quiet. Any questions about this guy? Uh, actually, Sarah wanted to know, just a quick question. Do we have screech owls in the preserve? Uh, yes, you do have screech owls in the preserve. Um, uh, you will hear them more than see them. And unfortunately the preserve is not open uh, when, you, when you might hear them, <laughs> but go out into the desert where it is open at night, you know, go down the salt river or someplace where you can listen. And they make a, a voice like a bouncing ball. Some people uh, relate to, woo, 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 as if a ball were bouncing and making smaller bounces. Woo, 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 woo. And you can hear them. And if you're very, very lucky, every so often you'll see one peeking out of a hole that a uh, Gila woodpecker has made. You just need to be observant and very lucky too. But Wes, we do have them there. Well, Kathy, this was absolutely great for someone that doesn't have a lot of patience for standing around with binoculars, <laughs> but really does love birds. This was a, a very special treat for me and I know others enjoyed it as well. So thank you so much for sharing My your pleasure. time and your expertise. And as you know, Kathy shared her email. So if you want further information, I know she'll be happy to help you. So Absolutely. thank you everyone for being here and please join us again on June 16th when we're going to talk about Arizona's deadliest gunfights. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.